Greetings, Noise Marines, and welcome to Codex Compliant. I reckon it's about time we got... musical. Over the decades, Games Workshop has dipped its toes into many pies. There's the Black Library that publishes books based on their properties, or when they were a distributor for Dungeons & Dragons, or even that one time in the 80s where they put out a bunch of ZX Spectrum games. But the one we want to talk about today is their record label. Yes, Games Workshop had a short-lived record label in the early 90s named Warhammer Records that released works from a small handful of rock acts between 1991 and 1993, complete with grim dark artwork. So let's take a look at Warhammer Records. But first, there is some backstory, or background lore, if you will. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but musicians, just like every other artist, have this weird compulsion, the compulsion to sneak references to things they like into their work. So just like that friend of your dad's who liked Lord of the Rings enough to call his band Minas Tirith in the 70s, the occasional band has referenced Warhammer in the time since its release in 1983. Given the grim tone of GW's products, it's perhaps not surprising that many of these ended up being metal bands. I mean, I'm not saying you can't do grim dark polka, it's just less likely, you know? The first band of interest to us were called Sabbat, a Nottingham-based metal band formed in 1985. In 1987, they were part of the first, as far as we're aware, foray into music by G-dubs. For you see, issue 95 of White Dwarf came with an unusual free gift, a flexi-disc of the Sabbath song, Blood for the Blood God. Now, you've probably got some questions along the lines of why and what is a flexi-disc? Fair questions, honestly. Well, the former is explained in the issue by saying that they've noticed a lot of people at conventions would show up wearing t-shirts from bands like Saxon and Def Leppard. On purpose and everything. So they felt like there was a substantial rock-loving audience amongst their fan base. And since Sabbath were already Warhammer fans and were acquaintances of Warhammer artist John Blanche, I suppose they were a fitting choice. I mean, I guess. And as for what a flexi-disc is, they're actually super fascinating. They're a variant of a vinyl record that is incredibly thin and flexible. Some like this one were square, but many others were round, like conventional records. These were perfect for giving away with magazines, or bizarrely, cereal boxes, since they were cheap to make and, unlike regular vinyl records, could be bent without being damaged. The audio quality was not the best, and they were prone to wearing out, but that's understandable given their inexpensive nature. Many even came with a place coin here mark on them due to being so lightweight they could skip around easily, and a coin could be used to hold them down. I'm sure when you clicked on this video you didn't think that you'd learn all about an obsolete media format. Well, welcome to the club, because neither did we when we started researching it. The issue would also feature a nice big article giving a history of the band and giving the lyrics to the song, which are... well, they're exactly what you'd expect. In 1988, John Blanche would do the cover art for Sabbath's first album, History of a Time to Come, but after that there's not really any more connection to Warhammer, so we'll move on. The next release of mention is Bolt Thrower's 1989 album, Realm of Chaos. Bolt Thrower were a death metal band from Coventry formed in 1986. They were approached by Games Workshop, who offered to provide them the artwork for their second album after hearing them play on John Peel's radio show. The band, being fans of Games Workshop, they did name their band Bolt Thrower after all, agreed and the album was released as Realm of Chaos, Slaves to Darkness, confusingly not using the artwork of the book of the same name, but from the cover of Rogue Trader instead, with the internal artwork being a mix of repurposed GW artwork from the era. The songs on the album were similarly themed, with tracks like Through the Eye of Terror, Dark Millennium, and World Eater. Now, despite what many believe, this album was not released by Warhammer Records, although it's understandable why people think so, since the album and subsequent tour were promoted in White Dwarf, and the album was available through GW's mail order. It was actually published by the record label Earache, with the artwork simply licensed from Games Workshop. This did mean that when the album was re-released in 2005, it had to have new artwork as that license had expired. They also dropped the Slaves to Darkness subtitle. The new artwork was commissioned from John Sibick, who had drawn the original Rogue Trader artwork. However, the band asked that fans boycott this re-release due to the label producing it without their consultation or consent. 
Although if you want to pick up a physical copy nowadays, you don't have a great deal of choice, I'm afraid. Now, before we get into Warhammer Records proper, we'd like to talk to you about a man named Simon Denby. Simon was a singer in a band called the March Violets before forming the Batfish Boys, later simply called Batfish, in 1984. He was a fan of GW's games and even appeared in a 1989 issue of White Dwarf under the stage name Simon Detroit. A handful of issues later, the Bolt Thrower album was announced along with a Warhammer-themed album from Batfish tentatively titled Tinned Oblivion. However, that didn't happen, because Batfish broke up. There was also a single called Out of Control by the Hungry Trolls with backing by the Lust Lobsters announced, but that also did not come out. However, by this point Games Workshop were now seemingly ready to commit more heavily to music and formed their very own label, Warhammer Records. And so, in 1991, Simon Denby would return with a new band, giving us... The first release on Warhammer Records was Oblivion by D-Rock, sporting Jim Burns' Space Marine box art that took some, uh, <clears throat> inspiration from Al Pacino. We have been led to believe, on good authority, that this album is tough as old boots. D-Rock were a lot less heavy than the previous bands we've looked at, but their songs followed the same kind of theme, with tracks like Red Planet Blues, Steeler's Kiss, and Noise Marines. Like Bolt Thrower's album, the Warhammer Records releases were a treasure trove of old GW artwork, again taken from many different sources. The album was also recorded at a studio in East Yorkshire called The Slaughterhouse. That's not important, it just seemed fitting for a band taking inspiration from 40k. The most notable song on the album was Get Out of My Way, since it was released as a single that same year and was later used in the 1993 video game adaptation of Space Hulk. You know, this one. It also featured Queen member Brian May on guitar. He met the band when he was visiting Games Workshop one day with his son. Brian, it seems, was no stranger to painting miniature... Wait. This this clipping only mentions Brian's son in the picture? Who... Who is the other child? Brian? Did, did you steal a child, Brian? Brian? We don't know if D-Rock's Oblivion contains any songs originally written for the unreleased Batfish Warhammer album, Tinned Oblivion, but having a quick listen to some late-era Batfish... They do sound similar enough to D-Rock that, especially given the similar album title, we would not be surprised if there was a few tracks from the unreleased album that ended up on Oblivion. But that is entirely speculation. Now, as fun as Warhammer-themed bands are, it does make for a pretty limited catalogue, so despite being called Warhammer Records, the rest of the label's output was more conventional. For example, they put out two albums by Nottingham hard rock band Wraith. The label would publish their albums, Danger Calling in 1992 and Riot in 1993, both with bodacious cornate artwork. The art is about as far as it goes, however. Their musical output was unrelated to GW's properties as far as we can tell, although the album Danger Calling does apparently have Lemmy of Motorhead fame singing backing vocals in it, which is pretty neat. Also in 1993, the label put out the hull-based glam punk band Rich Rag's Psycho Deadheads from Outer Space album. The cover of this one is a Gene Steeler cult piece drawn by David Gallagher. Not much to say about this band, honestly, except their fan base was apparently known by the affectionate term slags. Just felt you needed to know that. The last band to release on the label was a group mentioned all the way back in that 1987 issue of White Dwarf, Saxon. Saxon were already a pretty well-known heavy metal band who formed in 1977 in Barnsley. They can be cheesy as heck, but if that's what you're into, and a lot of people are, then they've got you sorted. They released one album and one single on Warhammer Records. Those were the UK releases of their album Forever Free and the single Iron Wheels slash Forever Free, both in 1993. The former uses an old picture of a dark angel on a bike, and the latter actually might be a unique image, although it's quite probable they just slapped the Saxon S on an existing Inquisition logo. 
funnily enough, although this image has the 40k double-headed eagle icon present, Saxon do have their own eagle logo, which has a far more conventional number of heads. Maybe that's why Games Workshop and Saxon were drawn together. They both have an affinity for slightly fashy-looking birds for some reason. I hope you appreciate that we managed to find a shirt of the Saxon album artwork. Uh, this came from Bulgaria, by the way. Um, that's not a joke, it's just apparently the only place they still make them. After the Saxon releases, that was that. Warhammer Records would only last a few years and then just cease to exist. Like a music publishing cryptid disappearing off into the veiny, grained film of our hearts. Games Workshop changed a lot around this time, refocusing the company on a younger demographic and then floating themselves on the stock market in 1994. The record label was presumably a casualty of these changes. I mean, the fact that they just reused artwork suggests that maybe they weren't as committed to the whole affair as you might have wanted them to be. Hell, of the two logos they used for the label, one was just the Warhammer Fantasy Battle logo, but with the Fantasy Battle part left mysteriously blank. As you can probably tell from what we've said here, there's not a huge amount of information available on the label itself. All we can do is look at the releases and see what GW had to say about the bands and their signings and issues of White Dwarf. And although some of the albums were re-released on other labels with different artwork later on, some would never be released again. So as you can imagine, all of the Warhammer Record releases can be pretty hard to find these days. Although, strangely, Amazon does have an out-of-stock listing for Rich Rag's album. A listing in the toy section that uses an image of an old fiend of Slanesh model for reasons that baffle scholars to this day. But what happened to the bands we hear you cry? Well, Sabbath carried on until 1991 where they broke up, reformed in 2006 and then broke up again in 2015. Bolt Thrower were a pretty well respected band in the extreme metal scene who continued to record and perform until the tragic passing of their drummer Martin Kiddy Kearns in 2015. D-Rock toured to support the release of their album, but possibly due to how closely they were tied with the 40k theme, they seemed to disappear along with the label. Although Simon Denby would reform his old band, The March Violets, in 2010, touring and recording new material until their last show, also in 2015. Wraith are actually still going, they even have a new album out next year. Rich Rags, well, we don't really know, there's not a great deal of information about them online. All we can really tell is that they only released one full album before quote-unquote imploding. We have read that lead singer Ian Hunter is now teaching at the Australia Institute of Music. Right. And Saxon, well, they're Saxon. They're one of those bands that just keeps going and have sold more than 23 million albums worldwide with a new one currently in the works. They've done okay for a group of lads from Barnsley. And that was Warhammer Records, a short little experiment by Games Workshop that didn't really go anywhere, but it was fun while it lasted. And given that Games Workshop is once again prone to bizarre licensing deals, it does give us hope that one day we too might have an album cover with Rogue Trader artwork on it. Thank you very much for watching through our video. This was something a little bit different for us, so we hope you enjoyed it. And if you did and would like to see your name join the list of beautiful people currently scrolling past your eyeballs, then why not throw us a dollar or two on Patreon at patreon.com slash snipeandwib. Patrons get to see these videos a little bit early as well as getting exclusive outtakes. Also, as well as supporting the channel, it also helps us eat. Which we're in favour of. Now, Rumble Vincent, the